Welcome to Bourne's window to the past and the present. I'm Skip Barlow and I'm a guest host today. Dan Warnicke's come with us today to give us a little bit of his perception of life growing up in Bourne. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, Skip. My story really starts with, with World War II because that's what brought my mother and father together and it, it's kind of interesting how that happened. My dad was uh, from Westchester County in New York, Elmsford, and he joined the Army Air Corps in, in, during the war. And he became best friends with my Uncle Jerry Gardner, who grew up in Miami Beach, my mother's oldest brother, who was also in the Army Air Corps. So they were Army buddies. And um, it, it really worked out <laughs> in, a, in a funny way. My dad had been a union roofer in New York. He was a, in the slate uh, okay. roofing business. Yeah. And so when the war was over and they, and they, they got out of the Army Air Corps, um, my dad came back with my Uncle Jerry to meet his family. And he met my mother. And um, my grandfather was the biggest roofing contractor on Cape Cod. Wow. And one of the biggest in southeastern Mass, I think his biggest competitor was John Mansfield in New Bedford. And so he used to bid on a lot of government jobs, uh, anything with a flat roof, tar and gravel roofs out at the base, uh, the school systems and shopping markets and things like that. Well, he got a contract to go to Trinidad. There was the Lend-Lease program in World War II where the U.S. gave like 100 destroyers from World War I to Great Britain. And okay. we got basing rights all over the world. And so they got basing rights in Trinidad, and they were building a big air base down there. So my grandfather got the bid to do the roofing contract. And so he took the whole company and the whole family down to Trinidad for three years. Wow. My mother was a junior in high school, so she left high school, went down to Trinidad, and my dad got, got a job working for my grandfather. So he was down there for the three years, and they got to know each other really well. And they finished the job. And they came back, and my mom went back to school at 19 years old. She was back to Bourne High School, which is the Cody School. And she was the oldest kid in the class because everybody else was like 17 years old, you know. So, and then my, my mom and dad dated, and they, they married. So that, that was how the whole thing got started. But it was kind of interesting. It was it's very interesting. Yeah, World War II brought them together. And, yeah. and my dad continued to work for my grandfather and became his foreman. So that, that went on for a lot, a lot of time. And um, when I was born, now uh, my, my grandparents had a big property on Linwood, and it's the one that uh, has Dale Street along the side, and there's a couple of buildings there. And my grandfather had moved the house building, had been, I think it would have been a barn, and he moved it down from somewhere off a of county road and, and, you know, on rollers, and he, he built it into a house, and then he built the outbuildings out back, and, it was a shop downstairs and an office, and upstairs he built an apartment, or two apartments, and my mom and dad rented an apartment there. And that's where I grew up for the first couple of years. And then um, the family, my, my grandparents owned a lot of rental properties over on Eel Pond Road. There was like four or five houses in a row that my great-grandfather had built. And they were called like the Birches, the Pines, the Cedars, they were oh, all yeah. on Eel Pond. So my mom and dad bought one of those houses, and that's where I grew up at 55 Yield Pond Road, surrounded by family. So cousins next door, and the next after that, and after that. So the Gardners and the Currys, and, I, and we all grew up right on the waterfront. You know. Yeah, so growing up on the waterfront had to be really different when, when you were growing up. So tell us a little bit about growing up on Eel Pond, and that had to be really neat. Well, in the, in the summertime, our, our summer outfit was just a, a pair of draven trunks and nothing else. You yeah. didn't need shoes, socks, you know, t-shirts, you know, anything. You know, typically we'd be playing in the woods when, it, you know, in the off season, but in the summertime, we'd be at the beach all day long. It was a little 50-foot public right away, right there. I think my great aunt had given that to the town. And so that was like the public beach for the whole neighborhood. And we'd all be down there swimming and digging coal hogs, what you would call belly scrubbing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Playing in the mud and, you know, and, and growing up there. And uh, just, just a really great time. And, you know, the gang was all my family. It was all cousins. You know, Alan and Terry Gardner lived next door. And we're, we're like steps on a stairway. Terry's exactly a year older than I. We have the same birthday. And then Alan is like 11 months old, and then Terry born on the 4th of July. Wow. And then John Curry was in, he's a second cousin, and he was, had a September birthday, and he was a year older still. So, you know, we, we all hung out together, and then I had younger brothers too, of course, you know, so. Yeah. 
That was that was the gang, you know. So what did the gang do around there? I mean, did did you have boats and rafts and things like that? Or? We, we did. We did. We had a uh, there was a little uh, raft and it was um, it was like one of those styrofoam donuts and they put a, a top on it, you know. Yeah. So we'd swim and dive off the raft and dig cohogs and stuff. But another thing that got me started on the water is, you know, and the water was such a big part of our life. But um, my grandfather used to take me fishing, and he always had a boat at Finney's Harbor, you know, a cabin cruiser of some sort. And I started going with him when I was about two years old. And I, I can remember him teaching me how to steer a course by the compass, and you know, you have to go to that buoy, and then you turn to this degrees, and you line it up on the compass, and he'd take me out fishing. And I remember one time, I, I don't remember how old I was, but he took me out, and we were either fond of fishing or fluke fishing. I wouldn't have known the difference back then. But every time I, he, he we were fishing sea worms, and he had to bait the hook for me, I was yeah. so small. And every time he'd bait the hook, he'd go below, and he'd, he had a little gas stove, and he was trying to heat up some coffee. And he, he wouldn't even get the burner going. I'd Grandpa, I got a fish, I got a fish. And he'd have to come up and take the fish off and put another worm on for Wow. Me. And we ended up with the old wash tubs. They had a half full of fish to take home. That was amazing. Yeah, it's just, it's so different today. It is. And, you know, and, and there weren't that many boats because they were all custom made. They were all wooden boats. Was this a wooden right. boat? Yeah, it was a, was a wooden boat. I think um, you used to have a Chris Craft. And I, I remember uh, the, the, the first boat that I remember, it was called the Just Now. And that was a phrase that they got from Trinidad because when you'd ask one of the natives when they were going to do something, just now, just now. And it meant like when I get around to it. Yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so he called his first couple of boats the Just Now and then the Eleanor after my grandmother, Eleanor. Wow, those must have been really nice boats in that time period, too. Well, the, the last one was his biggest one before he died. I think that was like a 39-foot uh, pacemaker with a wow. flying bridge. And he'd take that like to Billingsgate and go tuna fishing and all around the Cape and out to the island. So he, he had did, did you often go with him on those fishing trips? A couple or? of times I did, yeah. I, yeah. I remember getting ice cream like from look, looking through the binoculars all day long, you know, into the sun and things like that. Wow. And, yeah. Well, every once in a while, I get get to go on a big trip. Yeah, that would be yeah. fun. So, as you grew up, there was a lot of different kids in Miami Beach that would hang out. Did did, did you experience? Oh yeah, we you know because we all went to school together. And um, it, now my my first experience in school, we didn't have kindergarten back then. We yeah. had first grade, so we went to Peebles, and that was first grade. And I had Carol Valeri, and I was in Carol's very first class. Wow. So yeah, that it goes back a little ways. And then in the second grade, I had Laura Klump, who lived up on County Road. And she had taught my mother and my grandmother. So I don't think you've got any, you know, I don't know if there's any teachers that teach three generations anymore in the school system, right? Yeah, I don't know either, but, it's, but back then I agree. Mm -hmm. And it, I had trouble learning to read, and Mrs. Klump tutored me during the summertime at her house. I'd go up there in the afternoon, she'd, you know, spend a couple hours for free. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just amazing. You know, what a sense of community we had. And all the kids, um, you know, I, like Bob Berry and Chuck Hershey and the Phantoms, and we all went through Cub Scouts together, and then we went through Boy Scouts together. And one year it would be like, um, you know, Mrs. Berry was a den mother, and then my mother took a turn being a den mother, and Mrs. Morris and Jack and Andy Morris. And, and it was always somebody, somebody else, you know, taking on the role and, and doing their share. So it was pretty neat. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So I, I know that as time evolved, you, you became more involved with the, with the waterfront, and it, it's really been part of your life as you, I, I know you worked at the EMP for a little while, but yeah, you, you moved. Well, you know, my first, my first job that I can, well, other than maybe mowing uh, grandma's and grandpa's lawn, you know, yeah. for 25 cents an hour, we, you know, we all had those jobs. But I remember opening scallops, and you probably did it too, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whether you wanted to or not right, sometimes. Right, right, yeah. But after school, I couldn't wait to go over to Uncle Jerry's next door, and we'd go down to the basement, and we'd open scallops, Alan and Terry and I, and I think we got like 10 cents a quart. Wow. You know, but you could make money in a couple of hours. You know, at the end of the week, you're 10 years old, and you, you, you know, you got four or five dollars, you know. It's, it's really something. I, I just couldn't wait, and my mom would call me home for supper. And, you know, it, and it's funny, but uh, what a big part in my life that fishery played, because Later on, you know, after I got out of school, 
Um, and I got started in on a really good scallop year, I think like 72, and we, mm -hmm. we had a bumper crop. You, you know, you were fishing and your dad was fishing, and Jack Fanoff kind of, um, I, I was best friends w with Tom at the time, Tom Fanoff, he was probably my best buddy, and we had done a lot of things together. And we decided we were going to go scallop, and everybody was telling us it was, you know, a bumper crop. So I got my Uncle Jerry's dredges, he wasn't fishing anymore, and I got a motor, and Tom and I had lived at the infamous turkey farm that exactly, summer. Exactly, I the remember Mo that. Moody Turkey Farm, right? So they had that nice big outbuilding out back that wasn't being used for anything. And Jack helped us build a skiff back there. And I really didn't have much to do with it because it was going to be Tom's boat. But Jack had built some boats before and he knew exactly what he was doing. So he kind of led the way and Tom did a lot of the work and I helped a little bit. But I, I was rebuilding all the dredges, and my uncle showed me a little bit about how to mend net and hang rings and links and everything, and something we grew up learning to do. So we got together in the boat, the two of us, and we, we were a team for a while, and there was a lot of that, too. You remember we had... I a, remember the boat. <laughs> I you do. Remember the, and that became you know? Billy's boat, like the following year, yeah. I think. Tom did something else, and Billy yeah. got, took the... It was a fat little boat. It was only about 16 feet, but it was really wide. It was a nice boat. It was a nice boat, yeah. A really nice boat. And so um, before that season was over, Jack bought a new boat, one of those uh, ones made in Connecticut yep. that, that was selling down in Montagnes and Hyannis. Mm -hmm. And I bought his old one for like $100, I think. And I had that boat for a few years. It was a handmade boat, too. And $100 was a lot of money then. Yeah. It was. $100 yeah. was a lot of money then. You know, so Tom and I split, and he had his boat, and I had my boat by the end of the season. And I kept fishing right through till the very last day. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, oh, the, the the next step in that story—that's really neat because that's when Tracy comes in. Really? Okay. Yeah, um, she was a junior in high school, and I needed somebody to help shuck scallops. You know, I was I was doing my own. You know what that's like? You fish all day, and you get home, and then you got to shuck scallops, <laughs> yeah. right? So I had, I had tried a, a couple of different people that weren't working out, and uh, so I managed to get Tracy, and she would come in after school and shuck scallops for me, and Billy hired her friend, and so, uh, you know, but uh, it worked out really well, so, you know, she sometimes I'd have to give her a ride home, or her parents would come pick her up, and you know, you know what you smell like after an afternoon of shucking scallops. They'd be going home with the windows down. You know, I didn't think it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled like money to us, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was, yeah. Yeah. But anyways, that's how I met Tracy at 16. She was 16, and I was 22, and I kind of had long hair and a beard at the time. So, yeah. I, I don't know what her parents must have thought the first time they met this guy. You know, but. <laughs> But they were really kind and open, and you know, eventually we started dating, and we got married when she was 18, and I was 24. Wow! So, two years later, and then for some reason she stopped chucking scallops for me. <laughs> yeah, I can't you know? imagine why. It's like once you got the hook set and you got them reeled in, you don't need the bait anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and shucking scallops was a—it was hard. There was plenty of scallops, so it was yeah. hard to find people to shuck. That's right. That were really good and reliable, and yeah, yeah. And, Every you know everybody was fishing and had scallops, so you could pick and choose. And and uh, Tracy tells a story. She says, you know, I I had a choice. I looked at Billy's scallops, and they were all dirty and full of junk. I was Billy fan. Yeah. We, we we were all at the lobster trap. Yeah. Remember, we uh, Paul Shave had it, and we could rent uh, space from him for ten dollars a week. That's all it cost. And so it was uh, Tom and Billy and I were all, all down there with our limits of scalp. So Tracy looked at Billy's and she looked at mine. And she, oh, let's see, those are nice and clean and the bags are really full. So I think I'll go over there, you know. So that, that's how it worked out. Yeah, and, and the bag was almost what? A bushel and a half plus probably, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We, we'd shake them down and shake them down and heat them up. And, yeah, and but, shake them down. Yeah. Pack them. Yeah, and every time the town would come up with a new regulation, the fishermen usually figure out a way around it, you know? Yeah. Like they, they went to those uh, blue bushel boxes, and some of the guys were, you know, throwing them full of stone and putting them by the wood stove overnight. And <laughs> 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 there's always, there's yeah. always a way, right? Yeah, yeah. there is. And, uh, yeah, so. You, you, you didn't scallop all year, you evolved into other fisheries too. Right, yeah, because scalloping, you know, it's only uh, it covers part of the season. So then the other alternative was cohogs, and you can do that all year round. So it's, 
that's what we did. You know, but what I do, you know, I don't want to drag this out of you, but yeah. I, I do, you know, I followed your career just mm -hmm. like, you know, because we, we knew each other as we, when we were young and, and we fished. And you, it's typical for fishermen, if they need something, they can't buy it. They have to either invent it or make it mm -hmm. or come up with it. And I, I saw sure. you do this your whole career. Yeah. Yeah, and you have that. to, you know, try to be thinking about what works for you, and it's different for everybody. And somebody will think of something, you know, and a lot of it is copying things from other people. Because you, you don't want to reinvent the wheel if there's already a way, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, but we, uh, we got into the electric hours pretty early. I, I wasn't the first one, but, you know, I remember, like, when I was 20 years old, and I'm hauling everything by hand. And it's a whole lot faster than these guys with the old gas hauler with the davin on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, man, when I get to the point where I need a hauler, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to retire before I ever do that. <laughs> well, it wasn't too many, you know, as you get in your 30s and your body starts getting tired. And then when those electric hauls came, oh, my word, that was like the cat's meow. Yeah. You know, you could put the switch where you could hit it with your knee and both hands are free and everything's working. And now you're calling all the time that your machine's bringing the dragon board for you. Yeah. So, you know, just little different ways of doing this and doing that, that's all. Yeah, so, do, do, you know, when you get older, a lot of the things that were really frustrating when you were young and, and younger, they, they become funny. So you want to tell us some of the funny things that might have been frustrating? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Things, you know, certain things come to mind. Well, some of the funniest things were fishing with Bob Lowe. Because Bob, he, he, you know, and that was something that was really neat. For all the years, uh, you always had close friends in the fishery. And yeah. a lot of times it made sense to combine with somebody else, especially in the hydraulic clam, and you were yeah. kind of the pioneer of that. You and the Cahoons, right? Well, well everybody was, really. Yeah. The state came, brought that to us, and, and Barry Johnson, Barry Johnson was yeah. the one who brought it to all the fishermen and said, try this. We thought he was nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so much easier and more efficient for two people to work together, like yeah. you and Diane, or, or me and Barry, or me and Bob, or I, I went with Jerry Grant one time. When we started, it was Tracy and I, and we did that for one summer. And usually I'd run the pump because she didn't want to handle the manifold. It was kind of awkward and heavy, mm -hmm. and she'd rake the clams. And we had little Antonio, our son, you know, we adopted him when he was not quite two years old. So he was able to go out on the boat. Uh, that reminds me of a funny story I'll get back to. But So we'd have him on the boat, and he could get in the fish tote and paddle it like a surfboard. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we'd bring his golden books, and I'd put a little uh, uh, cutty cabin up front and hang a piece of a uh, blanket or something off of a carpet, and he could go in there and get out of the sun and have his golden books and, and little stuff, you know. But what a nice, and that was something we all enjoyed, you and yeah. I and the Willises and the Wassels, to be raising our kids and be able to have them on the water in the summertime. And, you know, it, it led my son to a love of the ocean that he still has today, and now he's got a really nice diving business that he's been building over the last five years. And, He's, uh, you know, really, really busy to the point where he needs to hire help to expand anymore. So, wow. yeah, he's, he's done very, very well with that. Yeah, that, that's good. And, and, you know, I, I don't think people in the community understand that even during our, our, our reign of terror, so to speak, <laughs> things have changed so yeah. much. I mean, a, a lot of the fishermen, and, of course, when I was a kid, I'd go fishing with my father. Mm -hmm. and, and I know you were on the water all the time. It was commercial fishing around all the time. And, and that's kind of disappeared but tell us some of the experiences you wanted to tell us a little bit about tony on the boat i mean that's really cool that you had the opportunity it's it's a real bonding experience well, when the whole I, family goes together i, I was going to tell you a different funny story uh, but when when, uh, when tony was really young like two years old because we we adopted him in february and his birthday's in april so he was just past two and right next door to us was gordy and kathy pierce with their kids and their son gus is uh, within a, about a month of tony's age so it was time for party training, and it was really warm in, in the middle of June or, or maybe late June. And Tracy and Kathy Pierce had the boys outside, and they put out a kiddie pool for them to swim in. And they had them both naked with the twin party chairs right there. So they'd dive in the pool to get a big drink of water, run around the house, and then sit on the party chairs. You know, and, and this was great with the moms because they're getting the kids used to, used to using the parties and everything. Well, the phone rings, and it's Jack Coughlin. 
and Jack's across the street. He was my homeroom teacher in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Warnicke, you think you might be able to put some clothes on those children? Because I can't get my kids to stay at their desk. <laughs> they were all at the windows watching the kids run around naked, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, that, okay. you know, when I, when I was over there in Cody school, you know, who was to think? You know, I look out Jack's homeroom window, and there's the house across the street that I'm going to buy and live in for 41 years now. Yeah. 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 So pretty. It's, it was pretty cool. And, and, you know, what was it like going to the Cody School? The Cody School was, it, it, tell yeah. us about it. Well, b before, before the Cody School, so we had, yeah, one through four was over at the People's School. Mm -hmm. And then for five and six, we went to the Stoll School, Stoll School which you know is the library, yeah. and it didn't have a cafeteria, so we'd have to walk to the Cody School and uh, go to the cafeteria there. And if the weather was really, really bad, they'd send a couple buses down. But usually mm -hmm. walk up Sandwich Road and cross at the light, walk up the walk through the elm trees back then that are all gone, yep. and then we'd have to stand outside the cafeteria at the top of the steps and wait for everybody to catch up, and then we'd go down to the cafeteria. Well, one day the windows open on Mr. Legan's room on the second floor, and the kids are all throwing erasers and pencils at us down <laughs> below there. But, so when, when we got out of the Stoll School, we went to Cody for two years, and that was seven and eight. Yeah. That was our junior high school. And then, then we went up to the high school. And you know, I think we had close to 200 kids in our class because the, uh, the base was going full swing. Yeah. And it, the classes were probably bigger then than they are now. Do you remember how uh, when, when you got into like the Cody School, all the like the kids from Sagamore would come and the kids from the base and all of a sudden you have a huge class. That's, that's right. You know, we met for the first time because you grow up with the kids from your village basically, right. you know. And at Peebles we had um, kids from Buzzards Bay and, and uh, Monument Beach, Pocasset, Catawman. But the Sagamore kids had Hoxie. So the Cody School was the first time that we met all those kids from Sagamore. And, and Dana Palmer and I became close friends. We were, we were good friends. And then when we came to the high school, we met all the base kids because they had been going to the two schools out there, Campbell and Lyle, I think, right? Yeah. So and then all of a sudden your class really expanded and you, know, you made all these new friends. It's really Yeah, by the time you friends. got out of high school, the, the amount of people you knew would expand that's huge. Right. Yeah, it was huge. Really it didn't happen in most towns. No. But here it was the norm. Yeah, that was, was norm. that was really something. Yeah, so I, I know your your son got into the, the marine marine coastal marine habitat and mm -hmm. a, that's where most fishermen's kids would end up. Mm -hmm. You know? So it was quite common, yeah. Yeah, for, yeah. You know, like like you follow in your father's footsteps really. I, and, I did pretty much, yeah. And for me, it wasn't wasn't my dad because he was, you know, he was from New York. But on my mother's side, there was always somebody on the waterfront fishing. You know, they had uh, like a great grandfather or a great great uncle that had a four mastered schooner out of New Bedford. And then when I was growing up, I remember my uncle Jerry Scalpin and my uncle Henry Curry had been a cohaga. And you know, and my grandfather was always fishing. So it was kind of like you're carrying on that waterfront tradition to, to keep working on the water. So that, that kind of meant a lot to me. It was, it was pretty yeah. cool. Well, I know as your career evolved, and, and Tracy too, your wife, she, she, she got involved with the Board of Health and then she moved on with the Buses Bay Project, which she's been involved with for mm -hmm. years and years and years. Yeah, and the way that worked out was um, we, you know, we were clamming like you were, and then all of a sudden Buttermilk Bay, Little Buttermilk was closed because of pollution. And so, uh, you know, that, that totally broke up our little family summertime operation. And so she volunteered to uh, help the Board of Health with water quality testing. Mm -hmm. And she worked with Tom Fantasi. And then uh, that kind of changed a little and she got involved with George Hoyfelder from the county yeah. the extension service. And they started um, tracing pollution points and, and doing work in that. And that led her to the coalition well, she was a secretary for a while, and that led to the job that she has now with the coalition. And she's been in like 27 years working with Joe Costa. So yeah. that's been a, a long-term thing. Yeah, and I, and I know that as you, you grew and, and the fishing 
kind of, kind of, I'm not going to say died out, but the, it changed. It just changed a lot. Coal hogs now are worth less than they were 20 years ago. That's right. You, you got more involved in management, too. You want to tell us a little bit about the management? Well, I we, know you really are. Yeah, we had to, we had to make some changes because we had, like, oil spills where the whole town was shut down and we couldn't do anything. And so you might have to take a construction job or do this or that. But I, I got involved in aquaculture a little bit. I went to work for Laquite Shellfish. I was there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm and learned that aspect of it. He was uh, growing oysters and quahogs on his grant and shipping them all around to, to New York to, you know, he was kind of a, uh, a wholesale planter. He would buy stuff when there was a glut on the market. He'd buy it cheap, plant it, and then dig it up in the wintertime. Yeah. You know, and, and that led me to a couple of other things. I worked for Great Eastern Mussel Farms, and I got my grant back in 1980, uh, my, my shellfish grant, and I was hoping to do long line mussel culture. Which, and I made contact with Great Eastern Mussel Farms in Maine, and they're, they're good friends up there. And that led to another job working for them, and I did that for a couple of summers, buying and processing mussels. Yeah. So all these things kind of taught me more about aquaculture. And I was raising, uh, I wasn't very successful with the mussels, but I did do pretty well with oysters. And the only problem with that site that I had in the old canal was that the ice was so bad, I'd have to relocate everything in the fall bring it back in the spring. And it was so labor intensive, it was taking a lot of time away from my fishing, which was paying the bills. Yeah. So I, you know, I was either gonna have to go out and get some financing and not really be in control anymore, or you know, find, find another way of doing it. And I, I couldn't take any more time away from fishing because you know, that, was, that was my income. So after three years, I ended up getting out of that. But then that led me to these jobs like with Great Eastern Muscle Farms and then mm -hmm. with Rod Taylor later on and I worked with Rod for about six months and he reached a point where he had to cut costs and I was like one of the highest people, paid people on the yeah. staff so he had to lay me off. But yeah, that was it's kind of an interesting job because he still is the only scallop aquaculture on the whole East Coast mm -hmm. and, and he's pretty successful still. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, you, you were right there at the threshold of it. You really it it was interesting. You know, we had, I was running a barge, which was different for me. I had a big crew of people. Well, it was similar to what I had done with Great Eastern because it was a production facility, and I'd have like 20 people working at a time. And I think we had over 50 employees as we went through some people. Or people had, we had a lot of students that had to leave, you know. But uh, we'd have about 20 working at a time, but about 50 on the payroll altogether. Yeah. And over at Rods, we'd have 20 people out on the barge, and we'd be seeding scallops or harvesting scallops. And the millions, I mean, it was, it was just incredible, the millions of scallops. I mean, we were growing like 12 million scallops on his site wow. in the summer I was there. It's not a very big site either. It's 25 acres, and yeah. he wasn't even using, yeah. you know, the majority of it. Yeah. But when you start growing stuff in that density, it's amazing because... The stuff on the outside of, of the perimeter of the grant will be growing really nicely, and as you work your way in, smaller and smaller, there's, you know, just there's, like in there's, the wild, there's a limit to how much you can grow. You know, phytoplankton isn't limitless. I agree. You know, yeah, you, we've only got a minute left. So, <laughs> is there anything in particular that jumps out at you that you'd like to talk or you've been thinking about? Because I know, I know you've got such a huge background. Well, one, one of the things, what I enjoy most about my job now, I'm, now I'm working for the DNR, and I've been there oh, probably about 13 years, but we developed the Linda Shellfish Program. We've had over a thousand people go through that program. We do four mm -hmm. classes a year, two for the public, two for born community boating for the little kids, so Rich yeah. Libin and I. Excellent. And yeah, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Time. I'm running yeah. out of time. They're, they're, giving, they're waving sure. to me in there. Yeah. But, you know, you, you've gone from being involved in the community as a fisherman to now you, you promote shell fishing and you teach shell fishing and you really, you're helping to form the town and I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming in today and thank, thank you for being thank you with very us. Much. It's thank a you.
Welcome to Bourne's window to the past and the present. I'm Skip Barlow and I'm a guest host today. Dan Warnicke's come with us today to give us a little bit of his perception of life growing up in Bourne. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, Skip. My story really starts with, with World War II because that's what brought my mother and father together and it's kind of interesting how that happened. My dad was uh, from Westchester County in New York, Elmsford, and he joined the Army Air Corps in, in, during the war. And he became best friends with my Uncle Jerry Gardner, who grew up in Miami Beach, mm -hmm. my mother's oldest brother, who was also in the Army Air Corps. So they were Army buddies. And um, it, it really worked out <laughs> in, a, in a funny way. My dad had been a union roofer in New York. He was a, in the slate uh, okay. roofing business. Yeah. And so when the war was over and, they, and they, they got out of the Army Air Corps, um, my dad came back with my Uncle Jerry to meet his family, and he met my mother. And um, my grandfather was the biggest roofing contractor on Cape Cod. Wow. And he, one of the biggest in southeastern Mass, I think his biggest competitor was John Mansfield in New Bedford. And so he used to bid on a lot of government jobs, uh, anything with a flat roof, tire and gravel roofs out at the base. Uh, the school systems and shopping markets and things like that. But he got a contract to go to Trinidad. There was the Lend-Lease program in World War II where the U.S. gave like 100 destroyers from World War I to Great Britain. And okay. we got basing rights all over the world. And so they got basing rights in Trinidad and they were building a big air base down there. So my grandfather got the bid to do the roofing contract. And so he took the whole company and the whole family down to Trinidad for three years. Wow. My mother was a junior in high school, so she left high school, went down to Trinidad, and my dad got, got a job working for my grandfather. So he was down there for the three years, and they got to know each other really well. And they finished the job, and they came back, and my mom went back to school at 19 years old. She was back to Bourne High School, which is the Cody School. And she was the oldest kid in the class because everybody else was like 17 years old, you know. So, and then my, my mom and dad dated and they, they married. So that, that was how the whole thing got started. But it was kind of interesting. It was it's very interesting. Yeah, World War II brought them together. And, yeah. and my dad continued to work for my grandfather and became his foreman. So that, that went on for a lot, a lot of time. And um, when I was born, now my, my grandparents had a big property on Linwood, and it's the one that uh, has Dale Street along the side, and there's a couple of buildings there. And my grandfather had moved the house building, had been, I think it would have been a barn, and he moved it down from somewhere off a of county road and, and, you know, on rollers, and he, he built it into a house, and then he built the outbuildings out back, and there was a shop downstairs and an office, and upstairs he built an apartment, or two apartments, and my mom and dad rented an apartment there. And that's where I grew up for the first couple of years. And then um, the family, my, my grandparents owned a lot of rental properties over on Eel Pond Road. There was like four or five houses in a row that my great-grandfather had built. And they were called like the Birches, the Pines, the Cedars. They were oh, all yeah. on Eel Pond. So my mom and dad bought one of those houses and that's where I grew up at 55 Eel Pond Road. Surrounded by family, so cousins next door and the next after that and after that, so the gardeners and the curries. And, and we all grew up right on the waterfront. You know. Yeah, so growing up on the waterfront had to be really different when, when you were growing up. So tell us a little bit about growing up on Eel Pond and that had to be really neat. Well, in the, in the summertime, our, our summer outfit was just a, a pair of draven trunks and nothing else. You yeah. didn't need shoes, socks, you know, t-shirts, you know, anything. You know, typically we'd be playing in the w woods when, it, you know, in the off season, but in the summertime we'd be at the beach all day long. It was a little 50-foot public right away, right there. I think my great aunt had given that to the town. And so that was like the public beach for the whole neighborhood. And we'd all be down there swimming and digging coal hogs, or what you would call belly scrubbing, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Playing in the mud and, you know, and, and growing up there. And uh, just, just a really great time. And, you know, the gang was all my family. It was all cousins. You know, Alan and Terry Gardner lived next door. And we're, we're like steps on a stairway. Terry's exactly a year older than I. We have the same birthday. And then Alan is like 11 months old, and then Terry born on the 4th of July. Wow. And then John Curry was in, he's a second cousin, and he was, had a September birthday, and he was a year older still. So, uh, you know, we, we all hung out together. And then I had younger brothers, too, of course, you know. So. Yeah. 
That was that was the gang, you know. So what did the gang do around there? I mean, did did you have boats and rafts and things like that? Or? We, we did. We did. We had a uh, there was a little uh, raft and it was. Um, it was like one of those styrofoam donuts, and they put a, a top on it, you know. Yeah. So we'd swim and dive off the raft and dig cohogs and stuff. But another thing that got me started on the water is, you know, and the water was such a big part of our life. But um, my grandfather used to take me fishing, and he always had a boat at Finney's Harbor, you know, a cabin cruiser of some sort. And I started going with him when I was about two years old. And I, I can remember him teaching me how to steer a course by the compass, and you know you have to go to that buoy, and then you turn to this degrees, and you line it up on the compass, and he take me out fishing. And I remember one time, I, I don't remember how old I was, but he took me out, and we were either fond of fishing or fluke fishing. I wouldn't have known the difference back then, but every time I he he we were fishing sea worms, and he had to bait the hook for me. I was yeah. so small. And every time he'd bait the hook, he'd go below, and he'd, he had a little gas stove, and he was trying to heat up some coffee. And he, he wouldn't even get the burner going. I'd Grandpa, I got a fish, I got a fish. And he'd have to come up and take the fish off and put another worm on for Wow. Him. And we ended up with the old wash tubs. They had a half full of fish to take home. That was amazing. Yeah, it's just, it's so different today. It is. And, you know, and, and there weren't that many boats, because they were all custom made. They were all wooden boats. Was this a right. wooden boat? Yeah, it was, a, it was a wooden boat. I think um, you used to have a Chris Craft. And I, I remember uh, the, the, the first boat that I remember, it was called the Just Now. And that was a phrase that they got from Trinidad because when you'd ask one of the natives when they were going to do something, just now, just now. And it meant like when I get around to it. Yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so he called his first couple of boats the Just Now and then the Eleanor after my grandmother, Eleanor. Wow, those must have been really nice boats in that time period, too. Well, the, the last one was his biggest one before he died. I think that was like a 39-foot uh, pacemaker with a wow. flying bridge. And he'd take that like to Billingsgate and go tuna fishing and all around the Cape and out to the island. So he, he had... Did, did you often go with them on those fishing trips? A couple or? of times I did, yeah. I, yeah. I remember getting ice cream, like from look, looking through the binoculars all day long, you know, into the sun and things like that. Wow. And, yeah. Well, every once in a while, I'd get, get to go on a big trip. Yeah, that would be yeah. fun. So as you grew up, there was a lot of different kids in Miami Beach that would hang out. Did, did, did you experience? Oh, yeah, we, you know, because we all went to school together. And um, it, now my, my first experience in school, we didn't have kindergarten back then. We yeah. had first grade. So we went to Peebles, and that was first grade. And I had Carol Valeri, and I was in Carol's very first class. Wow. So, yeah, that, it goes back a little ways. And then in the second grade, I had Laura Crump, who lived up on County Road. And she had taught my mother and my grandmother. So and I don't think you've got any, you know, I don't know if there's any teachers that teach three generations anymore in the school system, right? Yeah, I don't know either, but it's but, back then I agree. Mm -hmm. And it, I had trouble learning to read, and Mrs. Crump tutored me during the summertime at her house. I'd go up there in the afternoon. She'd, you know, spend a couple hours for free. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just amazing. You know, what a sense of community we had. 